Jesus. Glory to God. Let's go straight to the scriptures this morning. I'm excited about the word of the Lord. Are you excited about it? We are following here on the protocol of spiritual enlightenment. How many people were here last Sunday? Lift up your right hand. Were you not blessed by the ministry of Brother Emmanuel? Was well, just so powerful, amazing. That boy is, uh, is something, I tell you. <laughs> Close point has a future. Protocol of spiritual enlightenment. I'd like to speak today on the mystery behind worship. We are rebuilding in year one, and I visited the worship team a couple of Wednesdays ago, and last Wednesday I was with them here as well. These people are giving their all in all. They are working really hard. They are standing and they are keeping the pace. And I share a little bit of my heart with them because, you see, there is no movement without Judah moving first. If you want to see the strength of any organization, spiritually speaking, it has to be built first in the altar of worship. If Judah does not go up, nobody moves. Judges chapter 1, verse 1 to 2 say that. When Joshua died, the people of God inquired of God and said, Lord, now we are going to a new dimension. We are going in the promised land. Who shall go up first? We don't know what is happening there. There's Canaanite and there's Jebusite and all the enemies of God. This is the place where we've never been before. Who need to lead the way? And God answered to them and said, Judah shall go up first. And I felt it was right for me to come and begin to dig with the worship team together. They have been so faithful. Can we put our hand together for this wonderful team? They need our support. So Judah must go up first. So I come and lend my strength to Judah and say, come on, guys. You are doing great. We can do this together. Because every movement is established by the worship. That's the way God does it. Amen, amen. And so today, as we spoke about altars, I would like to teach a little bit about the altar of worship in the perspective of what is behind worship. I don't want to assume we know what worship is. Just because we are Christians, that will not be proper. In fact, we have to stop assuming too much things. We need to go even and dig in the truth of things that we've been doing so often and for many years. And sometimes we can miss the essence and the meat and the light and the revelation that is behind those very activities that we do every day, that we do normally. At the last, it can become a routine. We want to put an end to the routine. We want to go to the meat. You want to know why you are here every Sunday and what the heck are you doing lifting up your hand and buying down and singing a song and the music is going on. You understand? When people are born again, they come in the church, we, we think it's normal, they will know what to do. <laughs> no. This Christianity is a mystery. The revelation of God is a mystery. It's not taught in university. It's not that because you're born again, you know the all in all about worship. No way. The spirit of worship can dwell in you and you don't know how to worship. It still has to become a revelation. You have to be taught the principles and what is worship in its core, what it is. What are we doing here every Sunday? If not, you will come and stand in the church, get offended and leave because they didn't play your favorite song or you didn't like the tune that was being played or you didn't like the drum that was too loud and you didn't like the guitar that was too low. And at the end of the day, you say, we can't worship in this place because the music is not doing this thing right. You see? Have you ever seen somebody who complained because the music was not good, that's why they couldn't worship? It's because it's a misunderstanding of what worship is. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to announce to you, worship is not a guitar. Worship is not the piano. Worship is not the drum. Worship is not the bass. Worship is not an instrument. In fact, worship is not even singing. Am I speaking to somebody this morning? Say with me, worship is not singing. It's not guitar. It's not music. 
Worship is no music. Why are they not playing my favorite song? Me, I'm a spontaneous guy. Why are they not playing the spontaneous? Why are we not taking out to Bethel? Why are we not going to Hillsong? Why are we not going to Australia? Me, I like just Hillsong. Oh, me, I like upper room only. Oh, me, I like Shinak only. Me, I like the Nigerian style music. Me, I like it mellow. I want it to be a little bit calm. Me, I like when the guitar plays. Me, I like when the... Me, 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 me. You like what? That's not worship. Juliet said, me, I like everything. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Listen. If we have to build an altar of worship, we have to define what worship is. So that when you come to church and they are not playing your favorite tune that you think they should be playing, then you don't get offended and mad and crazy and miss your time to connect with God and walk out miserable. Because you must understand what worship is. I spoke to you about a couple of weeks ago. When it comes to the relationship between God and man, man does not decide about the patterns or the pathway that should be used to connect with God. Man has none of that. The gift and the ability and the ingenuity and the creativity of man is only valuable when it comes to kingdom matters on the earth here. But when it comes to salvation, to relationship with God, God decides how things should be done. That's why religion is cutting themselves, shedding blood, and doing all kind of ritual, thinking that they will connect with God. That's a religion. God decides how you will connect with him. That's why he said in his word that you have to repent and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Then and only then you should be born again. So you cannot be born again because you are doing good action. God said that doesn't work. He determined the protocol. He determined the pathway. He determined the pattern that you and I we should follow if we want to connect with him. Not us. So you just don't worship God thinking that's the way I do it, that's it. No. God has a clear protocol when it comes to spiritual alignment pertaining to worship. Allow me to take you into that long portion of scripture we'll be reading today. Probably that will be the longest portion of scripture some of you have never heard or read for one year. There's what we call the law of first mention. If you want to understand the meaning of something, you want to know what is the heart of God toward a subject, an event, or anything that God wants you to do. You got to go to the Bible and understand where was the first time it was mentioned. It will release unto you the heart of God related to the matter. You will know what was God's intention about this matter. What was his original thoughts about this matter? And that's why I'm going to take you to Genesis chapter 22, ladies and gentlemen, King James Version. Let's project that and we're going to read it through first and then I will come back to it step by step. This is the protocol that is the mystery behind worship. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, and it goes like that. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abram and said to him, Abram, you see the exclamation point? He's passionate about calling his name. And Abram said, here I am. Keep that word, here I am, in your heart. We're going to come back to it. I need to discipline myself today. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. And offer him there. Offer him there. On one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young man, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder. 
and worship. And we'll come back to you. So Abraham took the wood and the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife. I want you, as you're reading, you visualize this. And the two of them went, uh, went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. That word, here I am, is there again. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. So the two went, the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told them. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar, open the wood. It's amazing there was no fight going on between him and Isaac. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife. He's not smiling, brother and sisters, to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. That's a loud voice there. For he said, here I am. That word here I am is there. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son. Withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and behold, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide, Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mountain of the Lord, they shall be provided. In the mountain of the Lord, it shall be provided. In the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. The provision is not in the valley of the Lord. It is in the mount of the Lord, there shall be provision. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time. Somebody say second time. Hallelujah. He called to Abraham the second time. Let's go back to verse 1, please. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. And let's cut this thing piece to pieces. You see in verse 4 is the first time the word worship is used in scripture. We're talking about worship. Yet there was no guitar playing. There was no drum. Nobody was singing. So when you come to church and you think it's all about the music, then you didn't come to worship. You come to a concert. You come to a musical rehearsal. You didn't come for worship. It says in verse 1, God called to Abraham and said, Abraham. And he said, here I am. That word here I am, ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about the protocol to get to worship. That word here I am is, you know I'm always standing. That's what that word means. When God called at Abraham and said, Abraham, he said, you know, I'm always standing. Worship begins with a man who can speak to God by saying, Father, you call on me. I'm always ready. I'm always standing. I'm not murmuring. I'm not running away. You can count on me. That's what Abraham said to God. If you want to enter the realm of worship, you have to enter the realm of availability where God can count on you. When God calls your name, can he count on you? When God wakes you up at 2 o'clock, and you are tired and exhausted. Can he count on you to stand? That's why we, we haven't got to worship. We are in the preliminaries of what lead to worship. When God put a demand on your life, can he count on you? When he say, Abraham, he say, you know I'm always standing. In other words, I'm always ready to tell your orders. 
I'm always ready for your instruction. I'm always ready for your guidance. I'm always ready for your command. Mansi, Mansi, if God called you, then you said, here I am, meaning I'm always ready. I am standing, yes, Lord, speak and just let me obey. Worship begins with a man and a woman who's already, always in the watch. The person is always in a ready mode. They don't wait the demand. They don't calculate the cost. They don't look at the, what it's going to cost them. They don't look at the price to pay. They're just always in a ready mode. It doesn't matter if it's my favorite song or not. Elijah, you know God, I'm always standing. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to obey. That's where worship begins. It is a heart that is yielded to God to such a level. Before it, then God put a demand. They say, yet not knowing what God's going to ask. I will repeat that. It's a heart that is so yielded to God that when God calls on them, before God asks them what to do, they don't know what God's going to ask. They don't know what will be the instruction. They don't know how costly it will be. But before it, then God tells them, they say, Lord, I am always ready. Command. Most people stand for God after God tells them what God wants from them. That's not the introduction of worship. You want to take note in an inventory of what God wants from you. And after you analyze it and you think it's not going to cost you that bad, then you say, yes, Lord, I will do it. That's not the introduction of worship. Worship is to say yes to God even when you don't know what he's going to ask you to do. I'm speaking to somebody now. Before he tells you where he wants to send you, you say yes. Before he tells you what he wants you to pay, you say yes. Before he tells you what he wants you to do, you say yes before he releases the order. That's what the word here I am means. That means, Lord, you know I'm always standing. Oh, we need worshipers in the church. We need a people who always will stand for God. We need a woman and a man. Doesn't matter how much the day has been or the week has been. Doesn't matter what they are going through. Doesn't matter the tragedies and the curveballs of life. When God calls upon them, they still stand with all the weight they carry to say, Lord, here I am. You can still count on me. Even though I'm dragging a leg from behind, you can count on me. Even though my job is no longer secure, you can count on me. Even though my bank account is in the negative, you can still count on me. Lord, I am here with everything that I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son. Now watch this. When you read in the transliteration, it didn't say like that. He said, take your son. Your only son means take you. Because Jesus Christ is the son of God. Amen? Amen. Come on, talk to me. Jesus is the son of God. The father is in the son, and the son is in the father. When he tell Abraham, take your son, your only son, it means Abraham, take you. Take yourself. It's not your car that I'm after. Take you. It's not your job that I'm after. Take you. It's not your children I am after. Take you. It's not your spouse that I am after. Take you. Take you, Abraham. Whenever you come to a place of worship, everything you sacrifice is a part of you you're sacrificing. Then Abraham said, he said, take now your only son whom you love. Hallelujah. And go to the land of Moriah. Yes. Go to the land of Moriah next. And offer him as a burnt offering. Listen to me. The guy have already said, yes, I'm standing, Lord. Speak the word, I'm going to achieve it. And then God said, okay, you're going to take your son and go kill him. You know, he can't go back anymore. 
I want to push you today. What will you do for God when you don't even know what he's going to ask you to do? Can you still say yes without giving you a resume and an introduction and the details and the conclusion? Can you still say yes? That's where worship begins. As a man who had lost sight of himself. You can worship God when you are focused on you. Where it's all about you. I don't like the music meaning it's about you. Because they are not playing the music for you. I don't like the light. It's not for you. I don't like this sister, uh -uh, the way she's making some noise here. Now come on, talk to me. You come to worship and you become a critic. What worship is that? Anyway, keep, let go drop. Let me rush this thing and wrap it up in 10 minutes. Am I speaking to somebody? Yeah. So Abraham rose early in the morning. Early in the morning and saddled his donkey. This guy, Abraham, you know, when you talk about him, don't play around. Who here, God will tell you, after you said, here I am, speak that word. And he tell you, take your son. Don't think this is a story. It's not a parable. Oh. This is real life. Take your son and go sacrifice him. You will wake up early in the morning. You will be calling people, you know, what this bring me, no? I need interpretation. <laughs> I got to have confirmation, you know, the things of God. The devil can talk to you sometime, so I want to make sure. Sometimes God will put a demon on you that you think is the demon. Sometimes God will put a demon on you. you. You actually refuse it. You think this is not doctrinal. That's where you go in your theology, trying to justify everything and make yourself, I need to call this prophet to tell me. I need to call this other man of God. I need a confirmation, one, two, three. Every time you're rushing and running after confirmation, 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 it's because you have not stood up yet. You are still sitting. You did not say, yes, Lord, you know I am always standing. You are trying to do an inventory and an analysis so you can bring forth a conclusion that's profitable for you. Am I speaking? That's where you start looking for two, three, four, five confirmations. The voice of God is irresistible. God said, I want you. You are the sacrifice God is after. And the guitar will not make up for it. And the singers won't make up for it. You are the sacrifice God wants. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, as I'm rushing through this, when they arrive in the place, he said to his two servants, you guys stay here. You cannot go into worship until you separate. You have to separate from your budget and your bank account and the bills at home and the job issues. You have to separate from it. As long as you are in a place of worship and you are still thinking about your groceries, you haven't got in yet. You are still on earth. You are still carnal. You are still in the flesh. You are still in the normality of you. You haven't begun to fly in worship yet. If you still think about your school fees and how you're going to pay the bills and how you're going to do this, you are not beginning to worship yet because worship includes a separation. That's why you are able to see how somebody else is doing something. Because you are still here on, graph, on, on the ground. He said, the lad and I will go and yonder and worship. The word yonder there is the word we are going in an adventure. Worship is an adventure. You know what I love about it? We are all here and the Holy Spirit takes each person on an adventure, on the path that is proper to them alone. Once in a while we can encounter on our adventure, say, hey, how are you doing, Douglas? But yet, you are on your own road. God want to take you on a ride. He want to take you for an adventure. He want to take you on a display of a Serengeti safari. 
He wants to introduce you new panoramic view in the spirit. I'm going to yonder. Yonder means I'm going somewhere, but I don't know where we're going. But I just know we are going somewhere. It's that place where you abandon yourself, brothers and sisters, where you don't worry about who's looking at you and who's watching. You don't give a rip about that because you have been lost somewhere in an adventurous place, hallelujah. With the Holy Ghost, somebody shout hallelujah. Oh, I'm loving this so much. They say we are going to yonder and going to worship. No music, no guitar, no drum, no singing. Somebody's wondering also, why do we play music? Do you want to know? Can I tell you? Uh, please, project this verse for me, all right? In um, 2 Kings chapter 3. If music is not worship and singing is not worship, why are we playing music then? Why are we singing? I will say it again. Second King chapter 3, verse 15 to 16, and I will read it. This is Elisha the prophet speaking. What did he say? But now bring me the musician. The prophet now is speaking. Bring me who? A musician. Bring me a singer. Bring me a drummer. Bring me a pianist. Bring me a bass guitar player. Bring me a harpist. Then it happened. When the musician do what? Play. Play there. When the musician do what? Say it again. When the musician do what? That the hand of the Lord came upon the prophet. Musician play. When the musician begin to play, the hand of the Lord came upon the prophet and the prophet now is about to prophesy. Let's go verse 16. And he said, thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. Now, stop now. I want you to watch. It is not because the musician played that the glory of God came down. It's not because the musician and the singer sing that the prophet prophesied. If you read three verses before, the prophet is angry. Elisha is offended against the king. At the point he told the king, go and ask your mothers and your father's prophets. Leave me alone. I'm not in the mood right now. I'm offended. I'm mad. The condition of the heart of Elijah is not right. The prophet Elisha. Music and singing is not worship. It is to help you and I to get our spirit up above all the turmoil of the earth. It is to make ready your heart. Music as a way to tender the soul of man. Music as a way to lift up the spirit of man way above the frustration, way above the calamities, way above the tragedies, way above the hurt and the womb. With music prepare you to get out of that place, but it's not worship. I will repeat that again. You, you got to capture this. Playing this is not that the worship. It is to allow and help your spirit to escape of the grip of this world and the cares of life and the struggles of life and the anxiety and the fears and the worries and the bills and the wounds and the hurts. That's why these people are there. When they begin to play, 
the atmosphere begin to change for you. But yet it's still not that worship. God used music to bring peace to the heart of man and allow them to escape that heaviness so that they can worship now. Worship sacrifice. It can be on your terms if you want to worship God. I'll say that again. It cannot be on your terms to worship God. Worship is sacrifice. It can cost you something. It's not how you feel. It's not about your mood. It's not about who's leading the worship and who's not. Right? That is just an aggravation of usage of words. When we say who's leading worship, nobody leads worship. These are ministers. We, it, it is just a, it's just a language problem here. The musician and the singer don't lead worship. You lead your worship. Because they can play this thing the way they want and you can still sit down here and be dry. But, oh, you know, the presence of God was here. And then you feel like, what? If the presence of God was here, how did I feel the way I felt? I didn't feel anything. <laughs> can I tell you something? The presence of God does not intimidate even the devil. Jesus went to fast for 40 days. He is holy ghosted, he is fired up, he is dangerous. Yet Satan still show up in his presence. The, the, the power that was on Christ, but yet the devil still there to come and challenge the Christ after 40 days of Holy Ghost fire. He showed up when the sons of God show up in the book of Job before Elohim. He came also there. Satan is not scared of the presence of God. He is only scared of a man or a woman who have been in the presence of God. The only thing that will make him run is when a woman or a man rise up who knows about yonder ring, who have connected with God in the different panoramic view that the Holy Ghost has led you through. When you come out, the devil now is responding. Can we stand up on our feet? Let the Holy Spirit allow us to yonder. Thank you, Father. Begin to play something. Today, I want you to put yourself on the altar of sacrifice. Forget about yourself. Thank you, Lord. Allow the music to take you out. Allow the music to separate you from those things that want to keep you down, from those worries and those fears and those struggles. Allow this music to take you up out, to live your spirit beyond and above. the Spirit of God and let him take you into yonder rain.
let offer our lives as a living sacrifice this morning. Let the Holy Spirit strip us of everything. Weight, heaviness. Let him strip us all of our our self. and worship him.
you know, in that place of worship, when the Holy Spirit takes you on this yondering, adventurous place, that's why you will see somebody who is just worshiping and suddenly they begin to cry. And you wonder what happened. Because there's nothing in the physical here. It's because of an encounter. There is a panoramic view in the yondering that that person felt such a compassion from the Lord. There is a pain that begins to come in, but yet the Lord begins to minister to that pain, begin to heal that pain. And then you look the neighbor, the neighbor is going in spiritual warfare. And you wonder, wow, why this person is crying and this one here is jumping and smiling and jumping? Because in the panoramic view, God made them encounter a prayer answer. God made them encounter some glorious thing. And they, wow, thank you, Lord. They begin to rejoice. And then you look at another person. That person is just standing still. And they are fighting in the spirit. Because on the panoramic view, God just made them see there is an opposition here. But we're going to break through that wall. And you see them worshiping and breaking through. Brothers and sisters, when we come to the church, God has a path for each person in the place of worship. You see one person kneeling down. And you say, why are you kneeling down? One person lifting their hand. Why are you lifting up your hand? Some people laying down on the floor. What are you laying, laying down on the floor? Some people are running. What are you running? It depends on what they encounter in the spirit. Whatever you encounter in the spirit, it is dictated and demonstrated in the physical. Just because I worship in a yondering place. That's why in the place of worship, don't allow distraction. Because they will pull you down again on the earth. On the earth and you have to work your way again, up again. You know, sometimes you want to go and get lost. You are so lost. When they stop everything, you are still in the zone. You are still caught up in some adventurous panoramic views. Some mountain of the Lord. Some green pastures. And just, you understand what I'm talking about? And it's hard for you to even come back to earth. That's what worship is. That's why when you worship, when people look at you, they can tell this person is not here. This person is somewhere else. We can look at your face and tell this person is not counting the grocery money. This person is somewhere dealing with some divine spiritual encounters. He is having an experience with the God of the universe. We can tell when they look at you. Harabo Sandaya. That's what worship. So from tonight, from today, People of God, when we come to worship, don't count on the worship team here. Don't. You are the one who lead your worship. They are just help ministry, facilitating us to encounter God. But you are the one who do your worship. God is not looking for a group of people. He said, I'm looking for worshipers who will worship me in spirit and in truth. You cannot do that by counting the bills and counting the, 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 the groceries. Everybody has to come with an expectation, a standing ready, Harabo Sandaya, to say, yes, Lord, let's go. I love an adventure. There are some people here who like hiking. Some people like, like doing some ski. Some people here like running. Some people like, like walking. Some people like just walking, driving around. Those are your adventures. But there is a greater adventure every time you come in the place of worship where God can make you fly in the spirit and visit places that they don't exist on the Google map. Thank you, Father. Are you being blessed this morning? Are you being blessed this morning, church? Is somebody loving Jesus a little bit more? May the Lord bless you richly. Let's do one last one. Come on. Let's pick it up. One more, one more.